So we're talking about dirt simple data mining. Hopefully it's a good time. A um, couple of formalities before we get into it. Uh, my name is Matthew Thorley. I'm Pat Masalvi Masala on Posterous Twitter and Gmail, uh, but I'm M Thorley on GitHub, still trying to sort that out. If you read my bio, it says that I love Jesus, my wife and kids in the woods, and that I also write software. Uh, on the side, I do model for uh, White Trash Magazine. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you need like a mascot or anything for your site, I'll give you my card later and uh, we can, you know. Uh, I work at Global Base Technologies with a great team. Uh, I owe a ton of credit. Most of the stuff I'm going to go over in this talk, or a lot of it anyways, I learned from working there. If you know, you code in a hole in a cave somewhere, I feel sorry for you. I've learned so much working with other Sharp developers. Here's some of them. Here's another pic of them, and uh, that was a, during Mustache May. We had a little, a little bit of a party, so for all supporting our stashes there. A uh, couple of legal things to go over. Uh, this is all my own code. I work for a company that has NDAs and stuff like that. I wrote all this stuff from scratch. Uh, also, it's for educational purposes only. Um, you, you need to read Robot TXT and EULAs and terms of use and all that stuff. If you work for a company and you're processing this, you probably have lawyers and teams of lawyers. We have teams of lawyers. Every time the EULA changes, they go and they read it and you know, all of this kind of stuff. I don't know anything about that. Get a lawyer. <laughs> um, this guy, Peter Warren, uh, you might have heard of. He's a real neat uh, data mining researcher and uh, he gets into visualization and stuff like this. He went and crawled 210 million public Facebook profiles, made all these great graphs and visualizations, and then was like, hey, I'm going to give these, you know, this public data to the world for people to use and explore and visualize and uh, Facebook sent him a nasty gram and said if you do that we're going to take your life and kick your puppy. And so uh, <laughs> that didn't go over too well for him. Just some things you want to be thinking about. Anyway, we're talking about data mining. Dirt simple data mining. So what is data mining anyway? Um, it's according to, uh, to this guy here, the extraction of hidden predictive information from large databases. That's what data mining really is. When you talk about data mining, uh, I used to work at the Center for High Performance Computing, you know, where they have very large clusters and they have terabytes of data that they're processing and they're trying to make uh, use of that information by finding uh, things that are hidden or um, you know patterns in the data so that they can they can you know research medical technologies or, or whatever. Anyway. To put it simply, we're not going to do that. Uh, what we're doing is a little more like this. Okay, uh, We're going to talk about building a data set. We're going to talk about crawling and parsing. Are there any math geeks here? Okay, math geeks? No math. Okay, This is not real data mining. This is really about how do you build a data set or how do you consume open services. I said in uh, the talk description I was going to talk about storage and retrieval as I started writing code and putting slides together, that just got way outside the scope of what I could cover. And so we're going to talk about crawling sites. If you're disappointed, um, here's a picture of a car in a demolition derby. It's wrecked. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> Maybe not for you. I liked it. And so let's talk about why. Why are we going to mine data? It could be for research. It could be uh, you want to uh, go find out about your customers for your business. You want to do some research on the people that are following you on Twitter. You want to know a little more about their demographics. You might want to write your own search engine. You might be uh, doing it, you know, as somebody mentioned earlier, they work for a medical company, and so there's all this information out there about their patients and their staff and stuff like that. You want to pull that all together. Uh, a real simple example is my kids like Playmobil. And so uh, let's find Playmobil uh, for sale locally. The, here in Utah, there's a place called KSL Classified. You can find lots of uh, rad stuff for sale online there. And here's an example of a very simple crawler that will go to KSL. Uh, it takes all the search terms that you pass in on the command line. It passes them to the URL. It uses two basic regular expressions to get the title and the price, and it just puts them out uh, on standard input. So when you run it, it looks like this. You see it works you know, kind of okay. We missed the title on the first element there. We did find a match for Playmobil. It's trains with railroad trucks that cost $30. Um, but for, for this talk, we want to do something a little more advanced, a little more interesting. And we're going to uh, crawl Bebo. Bebo is a site that uh, my employer does not crawl, so I was free to take a stab at it. And we want to find people on Bebo. As I mentioned earlier, uh, David Richards, when he gave his talk, he was talking about open systems. I think this is really what he's talking about. Going to a site, he called it scraping, you know, just, just pulling pages off, getting information out of it. Maybe you've all done that a, a little more, a little less, just for fun, or 
we want to kind of do it at a, at, at a large scale. And so to do that, we need to find out how the site works. And so we're just going to throw a uh, email address in the search box here and click it and see what happens. And so uh, here's an email address that I set up. It's just a fake email. I created a fake account. And Mike Dragon, he's a male. He's 29. He put his email in there. And this is the page you get. And if we examine the URL a little more closely, we can see up here the search term is Mike Dragon at globalbase.com. And then there's some other stuff at the end that it turns out uh, isn't necessary. So if you want to, Search Bebo for an email, you just go hit this URL, you drop the email in there, and you get a page that looks like this. Now, on this page, there's the user's name there, Mike Dragon. We click the profile link so we can see his profile, what he's interested in, and we get a glorious page that says, you must have an account. So in order to crawl Bebo, we're going to need something that's a little more advanced than, than just a curl script or just a simple, simple web URI open. We need something that's going to uh, log in, pass credentials, save cookies, persist state, and do all of this kinds of stuff. So to do that, we're going to use a library called Mechanize. It's, it's a great tool uh, for crawling sites and, and lets you handle cookies and forms and all kinds of neat stuff. And so let's take a, a look at the source. This is the source of, of the login page that we just saw a minute ago. And the highlighted portion, you see there's a login form. The action points to secure.bebo.com, signin.jsp, and then there's some fields. There's a password field, the username field, and then there's this, this extra input field, which is kind of labeled funny. We'll find out more about that in a minute. Uh, here's, here's how we do this with Mechanize. We create an agent, which is just an instance of the Mechanize class. We set our, our, uh, our agent to, to Max Safari. Uh, we follow meta refreshes. That turns out to be pretty important. Yeah? Lighter. I don't think how do you so. Invert, how do you on that? Control Option Command A. Control Option Command Command. Wow. Oh. Hey, look at that. Man. The way you can do this really fast, we can have a disco. Okay. So here's a real simple. Uh, script to, to log into Bebo and you see uh, we go and we get the Bebo page and then we just look for this page dot form with uh, where the action is equal to a typo there. It's supposed to be pointing to sign in URL at the top and then we take that form and we set the email username, we set the password, we submit the form and then we just write out the result locally so that we can look at the file and, and see what we got. And uh, what we end up with is, is this. Uh, you're still not logged in. And so this is the kind of thing that happens a lot when you're, when you're consuming these open resources, when you're going and, and getting at websites, is there's little tricks that, that you have to start to pick up on in order to use their service. I, I'd like to think that they don't do this intentionally. It could be that, that they do, especially in the Ajax world now. There's so much going on with JavaScript and the way uh, sites are passing information back and forth. Mechanize doesn't support all of that. So you need to start reading source and, and debugging the, the site, so to speak, to actually figure out how it really works. And so there's another great tool that we use for discovering websites. Uh, it's called Tamper Data. Tamper Data is a little Firefox plugin. I don't know if they have it for Chrome or not. I've been using it in Firefox for so long. Don't have any reason to switch. But what it allows you to do is it shows you what the browser is really doing. It's kind of like a Wireshark for your browser. And so anything that your browser does, uh, your script can do, if you can figure out what it's doing. And so here's a Firefox. We just click tools, click tamper data, and we open up a tamper session. Now this is an example session. And what I've done here is I open tamper, I click start tamper, I went to Bebo.com, I entered some credentials on the, on the home page, and I clicked submit. And while it was running, you can see on the left there is a portion of all of the requests that were passed to the site. When, when you dig through that stack, you can find the actual post request that was submitted to the login page, and you can look at all of the parameters that were passed. And if you look here, you see that more than the, the username and the password are being passed, there's also this extra variable called sign-in. That doesn't exist in the page source. That's something that they've done with JavaScript. And so there is that extra form field in the page source, but what they've done is, is sometime in the sign-in interaction, they've taken that field, they've changed its name and its property, and they've inserted a value in it and then submitted it to their site. And so until you open up something like Tamper, you're not going to see that happening. So uh, to get around this, 
uh, what we do is, is we go and uh, just get the cyan URL directory directly and we make a post to it. And so we pass in the username and the password and now we're just going to pass in this extra parameter called sign in. Can you make the white again? You can't see it. Oh, thank you. There you go. Um, so there it is. We're going to say agent.post to sign in.jsp. We're going to pass our email, pass our password, and then pass in this, this extra bonus parameter that they've given us to discover. And well, then when we do that, this is the page. So we're logged in now. Mike Dragon has officially made it to his page. So let's go back and, uh, and, and look at this search results page again. So now we're all logged in. Now when we go to the search results page, we ought to be able to click a profile, and if it's public, uh, be able to see its results. Keep in mind that all of the stuff we're going over only covers public information. We're not talking about hacking their site or trying to find secret back doors, you know, or some way to jimmy rig their, you know, things. So you can do any, any data that, that this process shows is something that people have marked public, either because that's the default settings or because they've chosen to publish that information about themselves. And so now we're in the search results. We need to find the profile link. So we open up the page source, and uh, there's the profile link right there. They've got a member ID and some other junk tagged on it. And um, let's take a look at some, some code. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to write a crawler that logs in, that passes an email to the search, gets the profile page, extracts the member ID, and then takes us to that person's profile. So let's take a look at what that looks like uh, here. So um, first up, get member ID takes an email. It goes to the search URL there, passes the email in. And then we use a regular expression to find that person's member ID. Uh, you'll notice here that the, the, the portion of the source that we're uh, finding with the regex in order to get the member ID is different than the one we looked at before. Initially, I started just searching for profile.jsp member ID equals whatever. And it turns out that earlier in the page is a link to our own profile when we're logged in. And so it's returning this false positive where it always gives you back your login ID. And those are the kinds of things you got to work through. And so, you, you know, you figure that out. It, it looks really pretty on the, on the screen, but, you know, that's like 30 minutes or an hour worth of debugging going back and forth. Why am I getting the same ID? This is so, something's broke. You know, what did I change? Yeah, well, anyway. Uh, and so then, then we get the ID. We've got a method here called get pro public profile. It takes the ID. It goes to the profile URL, tags that ID on the end. And then, um, thank you. Oh, that's great. Blue screen at death. I don't think Max had those. What a bummer. Um, we're also going to check if the, pri the profile is private. If you go to a profile that's private, it's going to say, as you see at the top of the screen, you must be friends with this person to view their profile. So we just put that whole string in a regex, and we just test against that return nil if it's true. Um, those are the two driver methods. Let's take a look at the whole class here. This is the crawler class. Uh, we've got our own crawler here, we subclass some other crawler. Uh, here's our login method. We've got a little uh, crawler method there, kind of like, you know, template method. We log in, if we're not logged in, we get the ID and return nil if we don't have it. And then we're just going to return a hash as a result that includes the ID and the, the public profile body. And then there's the two other methods that you've seen already. Um, one thing to note at this point is we need a better agent. Mechanize is great. But it, it doesn't do everything that you might need for debugging. We want something that's also going to like write pages out to a directory so that we can go look at them and see what's actually being downloaded. Because you're going to, a lot of times when you do this kind of thing, you get to a place where you're like, man, all I keep getting is the sign-in page, or all I keep getting is this null page. What's going on? And you want to actually be able to go back and look at each URL that you hit and the result. And so uh, we've got a little fancier agent here. Down at the bottom of the page, class agent just subclasses mechanize. And then with modules, I just add behavior. I chose to do it this way because it allows me to plug and play what I want the agent to do. In production, I would just not include these two modules. But when I'm debugging, I want them there. And so if we wanted a little more advanced agent, we could pass you a hash and say, turn this option on, turn that option off, do this thing, do that other thing. Or based on the environment, set up your agent like so. Uh, but I did it the simple way. We've got one module at the top called Write Pages. It's a little complicated looking, but all it really does is it takes the page that was downloaded and it writes it out to a directory. If the page had content, it writes it as .html. If the page was empty or we got a nil response, it writes it as .nil. 
And then we've got another one called log gets that just puts the URL. So when we're uh, running this thing on the console, we can see every URL that's being gone to and so on. And so that's, that's the way uh, this site works. So let's take a look, did it again, at, um, at another, at, at an actual profile page. And so when we run the, prof the crawler, we get, we get a page that looks actually like this. Uh, this is this person's, uh, this is an email I had on hand. This is a public profile. If you go to that URL right now, uh, you'll, if you have a Vivo account, you're logged in, you'll be able to see their profile. They've got a band set up here. And so this is, this is what a profile looks at. There's lots of neat little information on there. You know, you can link to their photos and their friends. It shows you their gender. It shows you their hometown. It shows you their comments. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it tells people's interests. You've, you've all been to Facebook or MySpace or whatever. And you, there's just tons of stuff that's available. And so um, we also, in addition to this page, want to get their friends page because we may want to build a, an example or a network of all of the people that they know. So that's an example of the friends page. Um, here is the code we need to get that friends page. We just update the crawl method here, uh, extend our hash to, uh, to now also get the friends page, and then we write a little method called get friends list that takes a URL, um, gets the page, it checks for a private profile, then returns the page if it's found. I like to write my crawlers this way, where you basically have one method per page. You can sometimes uh, be tricked into thinking that it might be more efficient when you're on this page to also get this other thing and wrap it all in one method. You'll end up shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, if you need to, uh, to get some pages, you have to get other pages before then. If you need that kind of thing, the, what you want to do is you want to cache it in like an instance variable and hold the result and then go and get it and then use it in another method. But anyway, one method per page, that's the way I like to roll. Uh, let's go back to the profile here and take a look at it. Uh, once we have the profile page, we want to parse it. And when it comes to parsing HTML, I really think, uh, in most cases, regex is your friend. You can use stuff like hpercot, no kagiri, and I do have one example of that. They're neat for certain things, but hands down, I've found that just regexing a page is the quickest, most efficient way to find what you're looking for. And also, your parser needs to be flexible because as, as some of the speakers earlier mentioned, pages change. And you know, Facebook comes out with a new layout for their page, they're not going to tell you that. They don't send you an email and say, hey, by the way, in three weeks we're going to roll out a new format and it looks like this. So all you developers that are scraping their, no, nah, it doesn't work that way. You wake up in the morning and all of your crawlers don't run anymore. Um, somebody mentioned it being really important to have tests for this stuff. I failed in this example. There's no test, but it's really true. We have a whole suite of tests at work that we run so we can see uh, if we're actually able to crawl and extract information from a page and also be able to see what information we're getting, what we were getting, what we're not getting now, and on and on and on and on and on. And so let's write a flexible uh, parser parent class. These are the two driver methods. Uh, the way we're going to write our parser is we're going to have one parse method per item we want to extract. And so we have a method here called parsing methods that finds every method that begins with parse underscore. This is like convention over configuration. So in our actual parser class, we're going to write some methods that look like this, where we just say parse age, and then it, it returns a result. And our class will be full, full of these things, pages and pages of them. I've only done four in this example, but uh, going back anyway, we have a parse method, which when it's called, gets all the parsing methods. For each one, it gets the key, which is everything after parse underscore, like age, for example, and then just throws it in a hash and uses send to call that method. So it gives us a way to write a class where we say parse age, parse name, parse birthday, parse interest, parse whatever we want, use a regex or, or no kagiri or whatever we need to extract the information, and really simply work through um, parsing a page. So here's an example of the whole parser class. We've included Nokagiri here. We pass it some page content. We also create a, uh, a, a Nokagiri document of that content so we can use either regex is on the raw content or we can use Nokagiri uh, to walk through the dark, uh, document. And then there's, you see extractive, that's just a little help, helper method because we're going to do content.scanregex.flatten.first a whole lot. And so that makes it a little simpler uh, to do. So here's an example of the profile parser. 
Uh, we've got parse labs active, which just takes this regex, and that actually returns the date that they were active. Parse gender, uh, again, another regex, parse age, same thing. And then parse hometown, it was actually nicely tucked away in an LI for us with the class hometown. And so it was pretty easy to pick that up using Nokagiri and CSS. So if you're familiar with CSS, this is just a selector where it's saying get the LI element that has the class hometown, get the text of that element, and strip off all the white space, because there's a ton of white space. And then at the bottom, there's just a little helper there. So uh, what it does is it, is it creates an instance of the parser, and then it passes the content of whatever the first argument on the command line was, and parses it. Little things like that are very helpful when you're testing, because you want to be able to run this thing against a whole set of profiles that you've downloaded to see what you're getting and what you're not getting, if things are working, and on and on and on. So here's an example. When we run that pro profile parser, we just say, Ruby include lib, lib this parser. We pass it a page, pages, 3.html, and here's the result we get. Uh, this person didn't have an age. Their hometown is from the United States. There was no less active, and their gender is male. All right. Uh, this is the parser for the friends page. It's a lot simpler. Uh, all it does is gets an array of every member ID that matches this pattern. And so the way I figured this out is I went and I looked at the uh, source of the friends page, opened it up in, in Chrome or whatever, and just started searching through, looking for member IDs, trying to find my member ID, trying to find their member ID, and then trying to find the pattern in the page where it's just their friends member ID. It's a lot of cat and mouse. It's really kind of fun if you like puzzle games and things like that. If you don't like puzzle games and things like that, um, probably don't want to write crawlers and parsers. <laughs> so, uh, last but not least, we need to put this all together. So we, what we have now is we've got a, an agent that our crawler uses. Our crawler logs in, goes to the pro, enters the search results, it goes to the profile page, goes to the friends page, and then we want to pass those results to our two parsers and, and get a result in the end. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, very simple little script. We just uh, instantiate our crawler and um, get the result. Uh, with the result, we check it. We say, uh, you know, add, uh, get, get the ID if we have it. And then uh, here we say, if there's a public profile, parse that. If there's a friend list, parse that. Put the output if we had some, or just put no result. And when we run this, on the command line, uh, we just say run, pass it an email address, which is blurred out here. It goes to sign in JSP, it goes to the search results, gets the profile, gets the friends list, it runs the parsers, and then it returns this hash. Uh, this, again, their age is nil, they're from the United States. Here's their friends list, here's their ID, and on and on and on. And I hoped at this point to, to have some slides where we put this in MongoDB and do some different things, but uh, I just didn't get that far. So that's basically how the whole thing works. All of this code is online. I'll, I'll show you the link to that in a minute. So you can go to it and, uh, and browse that. You know, I, I got way behind. Let me scoot down here for a second. A couple of caveats uh, that you'll want to consider is sometimes you get pages like this. Like, you start crawling a site, you go, you go hit them a thousand times in less than a minute, and they say, um, what are you doing? There's, there's lots of, of little ways that you can get around this. Some people sort of hinted at it earlier. Uh, you could use proxies. You could throttle uh, your, your crawling. You could use different accounts. Um, a lot of sites have different ways to detect uh, you know, who you are and why you keep hitting their page and what the heck you're doing. Google is by far the best that we've seen. Most of the times, though, there's a way to work around this. Sometimes it just comes down to slowing your crawl. If you want to get a lot of information from any site for whatever reason, uh, you know, kind of be considerate. You don't want to do a DOS attack on them. Uh, you can kind of judge by the size of the site and the traffic that they get about how frequently you can crawl them. Some sites, LinkedIn for example, will actually throttle you. Uh, Amazon's another good example of that. If you start pushing really hard and, and trying to get links too fast, they'll just put a, a huge delay. So pretty soon you're getting you know, one link every half a second, and then it's every second, and then it's every two, and then it's every four, and then it's every eight, and then you're waiting 12 seconds a request. If, if you minded your own business and stayed at half a second per request, then they wouldn't throttle you. So something you can consider, another example of this is, is they'll just block your IP. 
they'll say, hey, you can't use the search anymore. Uh, we don't like what you're doing. And so you've got to find ways to work around that. You've got to be creative. Uh, again, legality is a concern. If you're going to a page that's blocked and the robot.txt or if you're using the account in a way that violates the terms of service, you gotta work that all out yourself. If, if you have right to the information, if it's your information, you know, you gotta figure that out. I can't tell you what to do. Uh, but anyway, uh, the code is on GitHub at mthorleydirt.git. You can get it. If you get a Bebo account for yourself, uh, you can plug that in uh, to the login information and you can go run and, and check your own email or your friend's email or whoever else's email or everybody that follows you on Twitter's email or whatever you want. Um, that's it. Any questions? Ready, go. Did I go too fast? Go so, ahead. So, I mean, the login, the one that I've struggled with is logging in when they have, uh, when they have a, uh, you know, some app, you know, uh -huh. some other app, and I really, and it's got the security, I mean, it's got those web forms, Microsoft does a lot of it, and I've been unable to get past that. I mean, I, I know you did the post. I'm just curious if you could show that, talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, logins are tricky. Every site's different. Some sites do it plain and simple, uh, where you just get the form and fill it out and post it, and you're logged in. Other sites like Bebo make it a little trickier, where there's hidden variables. Uh, there was one site in particular. I didn't write the crawler with it, but one of the, the Sharp fellows that I worked with did, and he ended up having to open uh, Wireshark sniff the packets as they were coming through, and then in his crawler he opened a socket and passed a stream to their server to say log me in. It's that complicated sometimes, but again, anything that the browser is doing, you can do. You might just have to bring it down to the packet level and send the right stream of data to tell them, hey, I'm legit, you can give me credentials. Question in the back? Since it's in those like old Microsoft like ASP sites, yes. those ones you have to find Often a view state, they call it, is like in the JavaScript instead. You have to find that pattern match and find that view state and pass that along with it. So usually the old Microsoft ASP stuff, look for the view statements. For those specific ones, that's what the main point is. Okay, so you said on, on Microsoft ASP sites, you look for the view state and that'll give you clues to how you can get logged in. Yeah, right there. You can find that, I guess, with Tamper. I didn't know about Tamper, but uh -huh. that, that'd be a good use of Tamper, I guess, finding the view state. Yeah, Tamper is a great tool. I mean, usually we start with the easiest thing first. You just go to the site, fill out the form, and see if it works. Uh, if that doesn't work, then you crack open Tamper, you see what's going on. I did get fooled when I was working on this. Firefox, and I think Chrome also has a, um, has a, uh, a site verification system, and all of that shows up in the Tamper log, and so they're going and getting this secure cert and doing this encryption thing, and uh, I was duped. I thought that Bebo was doing that, so I spent a lot of time Futzing around, wasting trying to deal with all of this encryption authorization junk. And when I just disabled that in Firefox, it all went away and I was able to see what was going on. Use Tamper to get the result and go on from there. I thought that. Okay? Uh, is there any reason to use Mechanize instead of something a little higher like uh, WebRat or Capybara? You know, when we first started this back in the day, uh, WebRat and Capybara weren't around. And so that's why we used Mechanize. We used Mechanize before 1.0. It worked great for us. Uh, one of the guys has played around with WebRat, and we did use it in some tests for something. Uh, the way it is right now is, is it's what we know. We know Mechanize. It works really well for us. It's really solid. It's stable. It does everything we need it to do. Um, but your mileage may vary. Something like WebRat or Capybara might be better for what you're doing. Or if you're just getting into that, definitely look at those and try them out and see if they're going to do what you want. Yeah? Do you have any good resources <coughs> for the, the data mining and analysis portion of this too? Like, because I don't know anything about that and if there's any introductory data, data mining analysis stuff out there. Yeah, there is. Uh, I meant to include a link for that and didn't. I'll put it in a, in a readme in this Git uh, for you guys. But uh, if you go Google uh, for data mining, it's like the fifth result. This guy's got a great page. And basically, he just goes through all of these different kinds of data mining uh, types of techniques you can do, including you know, Bayesian filtering and other things of that sort. It's really math intensive. I suck at math, 
And so you're not going to see me doing very much of that. But uh, if you're good at math or you really want to learn, you can go get those. And there's a lot of great tutorials on there to how to get started and, and make stuff work for you. Do you know the guy's name by any chance? I think, it, is it called Statistical Data Mining Tutorials? I think that's it, yeah. By Andrew Moore? There you go. Yeah, that's right. Andrew Moore. Very good. Thanks. Somebody's already Googling. A couple more questions. I saw a few hands. I don't know if I answered your question. Right there. Has anybody automated the login to ADP timekeeping? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> automated the login to where? ADP yes. timekeeping. <clears throat> yes. Good. That was a um, chance, but I'm glad you have it. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I don't know how widely we've released the gem, but there's a gem called Morton that fills in ADP with regular time intervals. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, great. Thanks very much.